Shall we start? Good evening. It gives me immense pressure in inviting you for this round of Reading Hub. Today we are going to discuss a fascinating book on the challenges faced by the people of Assam in the wake of CIA and the NRC. This is a book written by a journalist, Abhishek uh, Saha. Abhishek Saha was working with the Indian Express. Now he is in Oxford doing his research there. And we are happy to have Abhishek with us. We'll, the structure of this evening is simple. We'll have Abhishek making a short presentation about his book. And then there'll be a small interactive session with Abhishek. Then we'll open it, open the floor for question and answer. Thank you very much. And now may I invite Abhishek to start with this presentation. Over to you, Abhishek. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And it's a pleasure to be talking uh, about No Lens people uh, here. So I'll uh, share my presentation and we can begin with the the talk. Uh, is the slideshow visible? Yes, very clearly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, my book is No Land's People, The Untold Story of Assam's NRC Crisis. It was published last year by Harper Collins in India. And uh, this is essentially the book documents um, what happens to people belonging to certain migrant origin communities in Assam when uh, they are asked to prove their citizenship through extremely complex uh, bureaucratic uh, process, which is the preparation of the National Register of Citizens. And as we go ahead, we'll uh, see how the book essentially explores the uh, the the issue um, so uh, there might be um i i uh, i thought that there would be uh, many in the audience who are very well versed with assam and its unique uh, history uh, its location the borders it shares um, but I guess that an introductory slide, which basically, uh, so this is a survey of India map on the left-hand side, the Indian map. And here it's a map of Assam to, to just highlight. I mean, I, I uh, got this slide here just to essentially, uh, say, uh, to, to, to explain that the, uh, that how, Assam shares this border with um, with Bangladesh here in its western side, um, and uh, it's it's basically that we need to understand the geography and the location of the state to understand better the the issues uh, the socio political issues that has uh, has been um, happening. And of course, we can come back to this later in the course of the discussion. Um, so uh, in, in my, uh, th this small presentation here, what I wanted to essentially, the, the key points that I wanted to highlight uh, about the book and about my, uh, my reportage on the NRC and Assam citizenship crisis, um, these are the, the key points which we'll be talking about in the course of next 15 to 20 minutes. Um, uh, what is this book about? What is the NRC? What are Assam's foreigners tribunals? Who are put into detention centers in Assam? What happens to those who are stateless in Assam? And what is the CAA and NRC combination in Assam? How does that play out? Um, so uh, I have used uh, some photos uh, in the presentation, which have most of which, are, which uh, were taken by me over the course of my reporting. And um, this is one of them. This is a woman 
a Bengali Hindu woman in a district called Kachar, in a town called Silchar in, uh, uh, in Assam. And she is basically uh, showing a relief eligibility certificate um, of her father. And she, uh, when I had met her, she was basically um, applied for the NRC, for inclusion into the NRC um, uh, on the basis of this certificate. And she was explaining to me about her application and um, why there was a problem in her application because she was rejected in the draft NRC because uh, there was an issue with the NRC system accepting a refugee certificate because uh, there is no back end. Uh, the, the camp which issued, uh, which had probably issued the certificate doesn't exist now. So anyway, we'll come back to these questions later. Um, so what is this book about? Uh, this is essentially a, a journalist's account, of course. So I covered uh, the Northeast uh, based out of Guwahati in Assam for uh, since um, the middle of 2018 uh, till the middle of 2021. And uh, so around three years of my reportage on the NRC and other surrounding issues of citizenship in Assam, uh, uh, that finds its way into the book that comes together in the larger canvas of the book. Um, and at the same time, this is also a personal account because the, the, the central character with whom the book begins is my paternal grandmother. And she didn't find a place in the NRC. Her citizenship remains in limbo. And so it's also like, if, if those of you who read the introduction uh, of, the, uh, of the book, you'd find that it's basically, I was juggling two roles. I, on one hand, I was this dispassionate reporter for one of the leading newspapers of the country. Uh, and at the same time, what I couldn't report, I didn't report for my newspaper was also this story that there was a citizenship, a, an instance of citizenship battle and this NRC, uh, NRC you know, issue that was in the family itself. And so this book bas basically brings together reportage, but, but is also uh, blends that with, with my personal story of my family, my grandparents. My grandparents were refugees uh, from what is now Bangladesh in 1949. And how that had essentially what are the chain of events that led to my paternal grandmother uh, being excluded from the NRC, being one, being one of the 1.9 million people who are excluded from the NRC in 2019. So these two accounts come together. And the other thing that this book wants to do is basically document a history of the NRC, that it's not something which is happening now. The first NRC was uh, uh, the, it was first an attempt at something like the NRC, which was called the NRC, was made in 1951 by uh, then um, ICS officer, uh, uh, the census superintendent called R.B. Bhagaiwalla. And so if you, uh, one of the chapters in the book is about Bhagaiwalla's uh, NRC and what, uh, how he had made that NRC. It was basically the, he had, he had, it was based on the census of 1951 and he had copied those, the names of people whose name came up in uh, the census and made it into something that's called the NRC. So it's the NRC of 1951. And it's important to know about the NRC of 1951 because that's again connected to the present NRC. Uh, I'll speak about that slightly in a bit. Um, and of course, the other aim of the book, as is very evident from the title of the book, uh, is that it, it wants to document that uh, what the humanitarian crisis is, because to look at the NRC or the functioning of the foreigners tribunals or the fact that uh, um, that people residing in Assam for decades could suddenly find their citizenship to be under suspicion and then they might be asked to prove their citizenship in a foreigner's tribunal. And then they might be 
they might end up being declared as foreigners and might end up in a detention center so this entire saga of humanitarian crisis is what no lands people is about who are no lands people that's that's what we talk about in the book and of course the final point is it's a uh, it's also an attempt to to understand the politics of the a current strain of majoritarian politics a hindu majoritarian politics which uh, which has given a lot of attention over the last few years to is- issues which bind itself with citizenship like the like bringing in the caa and of course uh, there was this talk that about a pan india nrc that, uh, that that what happened in assam could be replicated across the country of course that's now stalled as most of us might know uh, so this is what essentially the book is about um so just to give a brief i i there are a lot of points to talk about but i'll just i'll for the for purposes of time i it would be best to sum up uh, in a succinct way yeah, in short as much as i can um so what was the nrc the nrc is basically 3 million around 3 million uh, residents of assam were asked to prove their citizenship and um, so uh, there is an estimate that uh, it would be a total it would be more than 66 million documents you know uh, through which people uh, were uh, which were entered into the database for people to uh, to find a place in the nrc now what happens is that that the nrc was that, that we know that assam has been uh, the socio political narrative around illegal migrants uh, Um, uh, causing severe socio political cultural damage to assam and its indigenous population um that narrative had has been going on for for decades now the issue of migration illegal migration foreigners quote unquote uh, that has dominated assam's political rhetoric for uh, uh, rhetoric and narrative for uh, for decades now you know and the nrc was thought to be this um, thought to be this magic wand you know which could be that that you know a bureaucratic intervention monitored by the supreme court of india that okay let's make a list and let's get done with it let's make a list who is a citizen who is a non citizen uh, uh, throw out the non citizens and we are done the issue will be solved but clearly where we stand now that the problem is not solved and uh, and it's uh, of course it's it it would have never probably been solved by such a bureaucratic intervention when the issues are clearly socio political uh, but as i said that the first version of the nrc was made in 1951 and that The, the, a demand to update quote unquote update the 1951 nrc to arrive at a list of citizens in assam started coming up uh, in the 1980s during uh, what many in the audience would know very well the assam movement which is a, a six year long anti foreigners movement in assam um, that uh, you know people took to the streets it's a great socio political cultural event that you know assam assam's illegal migrant issue should be solved that was the assam movement in 1980s and uh, the asu which is the all assam students union which is like one of the most influential um, socio cultural and um, it's a students body but its influence its indirect influence on assam's politics has been huge uh, and so the asu kept on maintaining its pressure on the state government on the central government that we need to solve um uh, the assam movement was also uh, you know uh, the asu was at the helm of it uh, the president of the asu back then became assam's uh, uh, chief minister after the movement uh, signing a uh, signing a accord with the rajiv gandhi government and so after the accord after 1985 accord uh, the asu kept on its pressure that the, the foreigners issue should be solved and one of the options that they always spoke about was updating this nrc and making this nrc uh, updated to have a list of citizens and 
finally things moved uh, politically uh, things moved things happened and um, if you read the book you will get a uh, if you will get a very um, clear idea of the timeline of how things progressed through the, through the 2000s and so finally we arrive in uh, 2010 when um, the tarun gogoi government uh, congress government in assam basically starts a pilot project in two districts a pilot nrc project um, uh, that we will do and see how things work out is it feasible to do this but there are protests there are protests there is a chapter in the book on these protests which is basically it's titled everybody wants a correct nrc and that chapter essentially deals with that why were muslim organizations protesting against these two pilot projects it was not because they didn't want a nrc they wanted so therefore it's the title of the chapter is everyone wants a correct nrc but this they pointed out really crucial issues issues which were very crucial towards arriving at a list like for example uh, that what about the availability of these 1951 nrc uh, or the 1965 67 voters lists where will people get access to these documents to apply so those that kind of discussions that kind of protest centering on those sentiments that um, uh, that there are difficulties we want an nrc but there are the practical difficulties uh, towards uh, uh, towards the application and towards the preparation of uh, of of the nrc in these two districts um, there is violence in a district called barpeta in assam there is violence and um, four uh, four um, muslim uh, youngsters are, are are killed in this violence and the tarun gogoi government calls off the pilot project after the violence but uh, there was a 2009 petition in the supreme court and by 2003 that pet- the supreme court basically gives it the final push to the state and the center that let's get this thing going and now when we i'll read a para from the book uh, which is very interesting because uh, i mean people who have followed um, uh, followed the uh, the one of the former uh, chief justices of the country would find it very interesting uh, is that uh, so i read about this petition uh, so this petition this 2009 petition was filed by this organization non government ngo called apw assam public works so uh, but i read uh, but for four years since its filing the apw's 2009 petition was listed six times without any comprehensive hearing that changed in 2013 a year crucial for the assam nrc Justice Ranjan Gogoi who went on to become the chief justice of India became a part of the bench hearing NRC related cases in the supreme court since 2013 gogoi heard the heard these cases continuously sitting on a bench in combination with two judges first with justice H L Gokhale then with justice M Y Iqbal and later with justice R K Agarwal gogoi then led a special bench with justice R F Nariman to hear all the nrc cases till his retirement so now there are questions you know there are questions asked about this there are those who have followed legal developments in the media they might um, if there are lawyers in the audience they might know of this of course that that uh, gogoi now a rajya sabha member of course uh, is an assamese and there was a harsh mandar uh, petition in the supreme court which actually asked that should justice gogoi recuse himself from the case but that didn't happen um anyway that's, there's a chapter on that uh, on the legal, legal questions which remain the legal questions which we can deal uh, deal with uh, which which provide ample space for debate questions and um so anyway moving on um uh, so when we talk about the Uh, nrc there are a few salient points which i thought that uh, the audience would benefit from is that the nrc and so when the okay so when the assam accord was signed uh, it introduced a special section for sit- indian citizenship in assam in india citizenship act 
and that led the way for a certain lineage based citizenship idea in assam that uh, and this lineage based concept is used both in determining cases at the foreigners tribunals as well as in the nrc so, and this concept says that for a person to be an indian in assam he or she has to prove that their ancestor uh, were in assam were resident in assam prior to the date of 24th march 1971 and this date of 24th march 1971 is connected to bangladesh's history the the war in bangladesh essentially uh, the pakistan and the west pakistani armies onslaught on uh, this side uh, you know in 71 the war had began uh, the, the operation searchlight those who might be interested so that's the date you know that's that's another chapter to 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 look at so essentially what the nrc asked is that you have to prove your ancestry that your father or your grandfather or you yourself for a older person were in assam uh, prior to 24th march 1971 so for example i am in the nrc and i it's proved through my grandfather my father and me so that line were well, that Uh, I I guess that it was my grandfather's nine documents dating back to 1966 or 60s, yeah. Um, and so as I as you can see in the PowerPoint, there are if you go to the NRC Assam's website, you'll find a list of documents. So what documents will be applicable to uh, to 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 show ancestry and then draw lineage? So for some someone. like me for example i would have to show that yes my grandfather was a resident prior to march 24 1971 my father is his son and i am my father's son so there will be two sets of documents through one you are uh, kind of your ancestry is proven and then your linkage your lineage is proven so yeah we can um, uh, and the, the other point is that that when the process began in in 2013 when there was this ias officer called pratik hajela who basically helped the process he was um, he was later transferred out of assam back to his home state madhya pradesh um because he ran into a kind of it was supposed a uh, issue of uh he ran into trouble with 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 the state government yeah that's that's another whole range of discussion on there is a chapter in the book called nrc's much misunderstood coordinator he was the nrc coordinator so uh so when 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 the process began when the, prior to the nrc application beginning i i think in 2015 i have to check the exact dates there was this what the state did was that they thought that um this availability of these old papers was an issue for people so these papers which some of which the state access them and digitize them so if you there there is a chapter on the book on this extensive technological process towards digitization of old records and making them accessible that so what you do is you log in you search the name of the village where your father or your grandfather or grand grandmother uh, you know mother from whom you want to draw the lineage you go to you search that person's name in that village in that district so these old papers were basically made accessible and searchable so you could search them digitally that of course led to many confusions like there are case studies in the book where uh, you know that uh, people had similar names so there, there there is there is this story about a man who goes in search for a for his actual grandfather because his grandfather was not a resident of this village which whose documents he downloaded but was a resident of this neighboring village there was another person of the same name in the other village so you can you can get the sense that of course those issues came up in large numbers and um, there are some major issues which would uh, probably for those of you who are very interested in um, there are chapters dedicated to these in the book um, the oi i mean as you can see in the slide oi is an original inhabitant category it's a category which basically paved way for 
uh, inclusion into the NRC through less rigorous methods of checks because you belong to certain ethnicities. So for example, a Bengali speaking Muslim would never be a beneficiary of the OI category. So the OI category was very much there and it's a very contentious category in, uh, in the NRC exercise. This is, a, this is a thing which if you, if you read Nolan's people or if you read other debates in the media on the OI category, you would know more of course, um, um, on, on how, how this debate essentially uh, questions the, the, the questions, the mechanisms of NRC that did some people have because of their ethnicity um, that did they have an easy, easy way that uh, whether to put it in a very crude way is that that uh, people who would come under the umbrella of the ethnic Assamese, would they have an easy inclusion? Yeah, so, and then there are questions of Panchayat certificate, and um, these are really technical issues. So, and there are case studies in the book which explore these issues in depth. Uh, if I go into them, it would take a um, uh, take a long to complete this presentation. But as I put it out here, that uh, those of you who read the book or those of you who Google and read more on these issues, you'd find uh, a lot of literature, a lot of debates, a lot of news reports on issues of how the acceptance of panchayat certificate and the effect that the acceptance or non-acceptance of panchayat certificates had on women, women applicants, uh, you'll, you'd find that. Um, okay, so he, some very, for people who are interested in, uh, I, I made this graph diagram basically. So people who are interested in Assam citizenship issues, but uh, might not be very well versed with the with the technicalities, the the real technicalities. So uh, this is this is really interesting to understand that that um, in in common parlance, it, it, uh, we often say that okay okay NRC is happening in Assam. This is like one citizenship process which happens in Assam. But no, city NRC is just. I don't know. The way I, I like to say is that it's just a tip of the iceberg. You know, it's just one of the processes. There are at least two processes which predates the NRC in Assam. Two very rigorous, it has broken people's backs, you know. So two other processes which predates the NRC. So the other two processes are that the low that it, what started in 1997 first happened is that the local electoral authorities at your district or uh, at your district level or village level uh, could mark you a doubtful voter, a D voter. And your case would then be forwarded to something known as the foreigners tribunals. That the local electoral authorities suspect that you are, you are a Bangladeshi, you are not an Indian and your name is in the electoral list. So you are a doubtful voter, a D voter, and you'd be sent to the foreigners tribunal to argue your case. The other mechanism is that there is a special wing of Assam's police, which is called the border wing of Assam police. Now the border wing doesn't go to the border to arrest undocumented people coming in or whatever. The border wing works here in the, in the state to basically raise questions on anyone and um, of course, most of the people that they have questioned belong to certain ethnicities, certain religions, certain language, linguistic background. So this is the border police. I mean, that they put a suspicion that this person is not an Indian, that this person is a suspected Bangladeshi and refers a case to the foreigners tribunal. And now going again back to the NRC. So what happened to the what happens to the 1.9 million people who are excluded in the NRC published in 2019? When the appeals open, now the NRC is in a stalemate. Things are not moving because there are political questions which will come towards the end of the um, presentation. But theoretically, when, when the appeals against for these 1.9 million people, these excluded people opens, they will also, they also have to appeal for their citizenship to the foreigners tribunal. So it's essentially the foreigners tribunal. These are quasi-judicial bodies 
these they are they are headed by these members and the members are essentially appointed by the guwahati high court but their salaries are paid by the home and political department of the government of assam so what i call in the book is i call them kangaroo courts in the book and i cite the uh, case studies i uh, through my reportage and through the reportage of several other great reporters i mean who have worked on this there is uh, rohini mohan's work there is arunav sekia's works and um, uh, so there are these the, they have the, the authenticity of how the foreigners tribunal functions has really been challenged i mean you know there is an amnesty international report where um, um which essentially uh, puts out a document which was for the first time actually revealed by uh, uh, this uh, my friend journalist uh, arunav saikia who works for the scroll and it 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 revealed government papers which said that the state government was marking people on the basis of how many people they have declared as foreigners there was incentivized that declaring more people foreigners was incentivized there is a new york times investigation as well into the uh, functioning of foreigners tribunals uh, if for those of you who want to know more as i said so this is a foreigners tribunal uh, this is how tribunals look this is a photo i had taken in 2018 at uh, as you can see in the photo it's uh, it says uh, government of assam foreigners tribunal number 2 barpeta uh, it's the second uh, there there could be multiple tribunals in one district so it's in barpeta district tribunal number 2 and um, as i said they are quasi judicial uh, quasi judicial bodies and they are kind of on, uh, only in assam yeah that's an important point they, they are only in assam they are not in other states of the country and uh, it, there are 100 currently uh, in uh, in assam uh, spread across all districts and um, as i said i called them kangaroo courts in in my book and ft opinions are routinely set aside uh, by the high court and they have come under severe criticism as i said the high court orders have also criticized the functioning of uh, fts and so has uh, reports uh, media reports researchers uh, research papers i mean activist papers etc and uh, the the last uh, this is another um, very major point when we talk about foreigners tribunals and again uh, for the paucity of time it would not be possible to go into it at length but but there's there's this very interesting thing which happens at foreigners tribunals and they account for the vast majority of orders that are tribunal foreigners tribunals in assam pass they are called ex parte orders so essentially if a person uh for some reason or the other there are contestations Uh, there are uh, uh, there there could be many reasons but but if for some reason a person who has been sent a notice by a foreigners tribunal that please come and prove your indian citizenship if that person is unable to present herself at the at the tribunal the tribunal has the power to declare that person as a foreigner in her absence that's called an ex parte order and if you read a uh, government of assam's and central government's data which are cited in the book uh, the parliament data uh, the data presented by the mha in the lok sabha and rajya sabha you see that a vast majority of these uh, of the foreigners tribunals orders are actually ex parte orders so yeah that's that, there's a chapter on this in the in the book with some uh, with some reported cases yeah uh so i have put two more photos that i had taken this is how foreigners tribunals essentially look like these are housed in normal buildings i mean on the left hand side uh, uh, sorry i misspelled barpeta here uh so there is this is another tribunal at barpeta this is a car uh, the member gets a car also uh, you could see uh, there is a uh, it's marked member foreigners tribunal uh, on the other hand uh, other hand, right hand side it's a photo of a foreigners tribunal in boko at a place called boko in assam uh, the, there was the storm the, the previous night and the and the sign board is ripped off kind of um and so these are some of the this is the latest uh, government data that's out there um mha reply to rajya sabha on 9th february just few days back 
Um, so this is essentially, you can see that people declared as foreigners as on 31st December is 1,43,000. People declared as Indians, 1,21,000. And um, these are cumulative figures, of course, and cases pen pending. And so I have marked this figure in red, which is 329, because I'll come to this now about the question of deportation. So people who uh, who may not be people in the audience who might be curious, uh, you know, as uh, for uh, regarding the situation, uh, you might be wondering that if the foreigners tribunal has said that these people are not Indians, then why not? Why are we not sending them, deporting them back to the country they belong to, Bangladesh, presumably in, in, mo in most cases, right? But that hasn't happened and that doesn't happen because number one, a vast majority of the people who are declared as foreigners by these foreigners tribunals, they are ready to contest tooth and nail that they are Indian citizens and they have been unjustly declared as foreigners. They might be uh, Bengali speaking Muslims or they might be Bengali speaking Hindus, uh, you know, uh, but uh, ethnicity apart, uh, as far as the vast majority of people, people that I have interviewed, people that other media reports have interviewed, people that researchers have interviewed, you will see that the, the vast majority of them actually appeal to higher courts, to the Guwahati High Court, to the Supreme Court of India. There are so many cases where the Supreme Court has intervened, you know, and there are amazing lawyers who are working with people like um, my friend um, Aman Wadud, one of the most uh, prominent lawyers who are working uh, with uh, cases in Assam. Uh, so, so the, and, and the other thing why deportation doesn't work is that Bangladesh doesn't accept these people. Bangladesh, as you might remember, that Bangladesh had famously said that this is India's internal matter, NRC, you know. So Bangladesh doesn't accept. So there is, so there the, they're the limbo, they're the question of statelessness comes in, that what happens to these people? India doesn't declare, uh, consider them as their own. Bangladesh doesn't. The legal bureaucratic and police mechanism raises suspicion and declares them as foreigners. So thereby we come to what I want to um, uh, describe as no lands people, you know, the stateless people. And um, so this is another distinction. I thought that for the interest of the audience, this would be interesting. DF plus CF equal to foreigners. So DF are declared foreigners. People who contest, who believe that they are Indians, but the foreigners tribunal say that you are declared to be foreigners because you are not able to prove your citizenship or you are absent from the tribunal, ex parte order. And a convicted foreigner is someone who is a foreigner. She accepts that she is a foreigner. Uh, the, the, uh, she's tried by the judicial court. She said that, okay, you had, you, you had come to India and you have overstayed your legal visa. So now please, you have to, uh, you have to, you know, um, uh, complete your jail sentence. And then the, uh, then the uh, foreign affairs, uh, external affairs uh, ministry will do the needful to deport you. So uh, as I have put it, like um, the data that I have used in Nolan's people, is uh, it's slightly old in comparison to the earlier slide. It's uh, the October to till October 2019. So you can see that till October 2019, 1.29 lakh people were declared foreigners. Out of which, out of the declared foreigners, only six were deported: four to Bangladesh, two to Afghanistan. But in contrast, I contrasted this with 2019 data from the Assam government, which essentially shows that. Uh, 147 convicted foreigners were deported to Bangladesh and three to Afghanistan. So you get, I mean, we get a picture that whose deportation happens essentially. So there is a chapter in the book, which is called detention and deportation that uh, looking at the question of whom do we deport? Are we able to deport? Why are we not able to deport, etc. cetera? Um, we come to the question, the fourth issue in this presentation, which is detention centers in Assam. Uh, as I had already said that the, that the one, it, there, there was, at least I remember that in 2018-19, there was a lot of social media conversation which said that, okay, people in Assam who are not in NRC will be put into detention centers. That doesn't happen that way. 
So there are six existing detention centers housed in district jails. They have been meant to hold um, people declared to be foreigners by the foreigners tribunals. They also hold convicted foreigners. That's also a thing. But essentially, if you're declared a foreigner by the foreigners tribunal, the detention center is meant to hold you. Uh, not that because you, sorry, not that because you couldn't make it to the NRC. So uh, you would, uh, like when the NRC was published, you would be automatically put into a, no, that was not the case. The photo on your screen is a new detention center, which is being constructed in Gualpara district in Assam. Uh, this is a, this is an um, amenity, a carceral facility, which is, uh, so as I said, that the earlier six uh, J, uh, detention centers are uh, uh, housed in district jails. But this is an independent construction meant, meant solely to hold uh, foreigners, you know, quote unquote foreigners. And again, um, those who are interested uh, in Nolan's people, you will find in other writings, other media reports, uh, you would find that there was this famous petition by Harsh Mandar um, on the plight of detention centers that, uh, um, that was... Um, uh, you know, there was this report written by him, which was eye-opening because um, activists in general were not, activists or journalists were not allowed into the, the six detention centers. But um, Mandar was with the minorities commission then, and he was given an access to, uh, so there is this report, which which is very, uh, uh, which is a, which is a tragic read, a sad read, essentially. Uh, and then there is also a petition by Mandar to the Supreme Court, which essentially challenged the idea of indefinite, uh, indefinite non-bailable jail terms. I mean, detention, not jail term, but detention for those who were declared foreigners uh, by the foreigners tribunals. So his petition essentially led to certain conditions that people who have completed three years, they are stateless, please, please. So they are stateless, but the state, the, the court said that we can release them on a conditional bail once they have completed three years. There are certain conditions, biometric submissions, etc. But once they have completed three years, they could be uh, released on conditional bail. And that has actually led to the number of people in detention centers in Assam. You know that um, Assam got a lot of international media attention, a lot of attention, negative attention for these detention centers. But after Mandar's petition, and there was another petition during COVID when we were talking about congestion in jails, uh, that petition also led to a decision that uh, during Ma in Mandar's petition, we had come to three years. But with the COVID petition, we came to two years. So now someone, a declared foreigner, can be released on conditional bail uh, from a jail after completion two years. That person will still be stateless. He doesn't have Indian citizenship, but he can be, he will not be in a carceral facility. Um, this is a, this is a, one of my news reports. Uh, I was one of probably the first journalist to write in detail about this new construction whose photo uh, I had uh, shown. Uh, and um, so, uh, yeah, declared foreigners and convicted foreigners too, um, um, not related to the NRC exclusion directly, as I said. And uh, latest Assam government data, July 2021, uh, in the six existing detention facilities, 181 are lodged, 61 are DFs, and 120 are CFs. Uh, so that's where we stand. Um, next, uh, what happens to the stateless in Assam? Uh, as I said, uh, they are in limbo. They are um, stuck between India and Bangladesh. Deportation possibility is bleak for declared foreigners. And, um, uh, you know, um, th there are many whose cases are pending in uh, high court, in Supreme Court. Um, the cases are going on. And um, um, so the, and the other thing is that, that um, the, the NRC parallelly has reached a stalemate. 
um, because the ruling BJP government in Assam and important socio-political organizations like the ASU, they have said that they cannot accept the NRC published in 2019 because the figure of 1.9 million people uh, exclusion, the exclusion figure of 1.9 million people is too low, is too low. And the BJP, for example, says that uh, the, the published NRC suffers from uh, wrongful inclusion and wrongful exclusion. People who should have been excluded have found a place and people who should have been included uh, have been excluded. So there is also a Hindu Muslim connotation uh, when we look at it through, when we try to analyze the BJP's political narrative, uh, if, we, if we go through that route. Um, uh, and the uh, statelessness continues as well as the political rhetoric continues. The person whose photo you see on your screen is Ajbahar Ali. Ajbahar Ali, so I have in the next, in this slide and the next slide, I'll read one or two paragraphs just, uh, you know, to, uh, there is a part of this book, the part two of this book, which is essentially case studies, which are uh, reported case studies with the, that part is called Chronicles of Statelessness. So um, just to quickly read a, read a para from, uh, you know, Ajbahar Ali's uh, uh, case. Uh, uh, in January 2020, I traveled 200 kilometers from Guwahati to Khelwapara to meet Ajbahar Ali, who was released from the Gualpara Detention Center on conditional bail after three years of incarceration. Um, Ali, a man in his 50s, sported a white goatee on his otherwise clean-shaven face and had an Assamese uh, gamusa tied on his head. Uh, uh, though out of prison, he said he did not feel like a free man. He was still a foreigner. Quote, uh, I have to appear at the local police station once a week, he said. His appeal against the FT and the High Court orders were pending at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's order on Harshmander's petition mitigated the pain of being lodged in jail where living conditions were questionable without having committed any actual crime. But such a conditional release did not erase uh, what Momiran Nessa, I'll show you Nessa's photo, another such person, uh, did not erase what Momiran Nessa described as the foreigner stamp. The release bought no legal sucker to their citizenship status. Ali and Nessa and hundreds like them continue to be stateless. So then this chapter goes on about Ajbahar Ali. Ajbahar Ali's case was really tragic because uh, uh, when he was arrested and put into a detention center, his son was trying to arrange the funds to fight the legal cases. And because of her husband being put in a detention center and her son doing anything and everything to make ends meet and gather funds for a legal, for an appeal at the high court, Ajbar Ali's wife died by suicide. So that's one of the saddest, a very sad story you will um, encounter. Ajbar Ali also appears in that New York Times documentary, which I was, which I mentioned earlier in, in, the, in the talk. And these are two women. Uh, there is a chapter in the book called 10, 10 Long Years. These two women on your left is Halima Khatun uh, and the, uh, on the other one is Momiran Nessa, who, whose name I had just taken. These two women had spent 10 years in detention centers. Their legal cases have failed. They are stateless. They are now out on bail. And um, I will read just two paragraphs and not take long. I'll just read two paragraphs, uh, one paragraph each for, uh, for these. Uh, uh, for, for the few women. Uh, in, June, uh, in June 2010, Momiron Nessa, then in her mid-30s and three months pregnant with her fourth child, was sent to a detention center. Later that year, she gave birth to a stillborn in the detention center. Her long battle, long legal battle, to prove her citizenship was unsuccessful. After nine years and six months, she was out on bail 
thanks to a Supreme Court order for conditional release of those foreigners, quote unquote, who had spent over three years in detention centers. From the detention facility in Kokrajhar, Nessa stepped out into an unrecognizable world she knew little about. Her youngest son, Mizanur, failed to recognize her when she arrived at her father's house at Rangapani in Bongaigaon district. Mizanur was three then when his mother was sent to the detention camp and had met her only once in jail. After Nessa cried and hugged Mizanur and told him she was his mother, she asked the relative gathered in the courtyard, where is he? Does he not want to meet me? Her question was met with stoic silence. It was then that she came to know that in August 2019, her husband, Jel Hussein, had succumbed to a cardiac ailment, but the family had kept the news from her. So this is about uh, this is about Momiron Nessa, and uh, the, uh, the on the on the left hand side is Halima Khatun. The, the photo is from the newspaper Mumbai Mirror, uh, taken by my friend uh, and journalist uh, Sadiq Nagvi. Uh, so, uh, yeah, one one or two paragraphs about Halima Khatun. Another woman who spent as much time in the detention center in Assam as Nessa was Halima Khatun. There are several parallels in the lives of the two women who got to know each other well as inmates of the Kokrajhar jail. Khatun, a resident of Patia Chapuri village in Nogaon district of central Assam, was also declared an illegal foreigner by an ex parte order in February 2008. For two years from March 2009, she was lodged in Nogao Central Jail along with her two-year-old son, Bulbul, before being shifted to Kokrajhar. She too lost her appeal against the Foreigners' Tribunal order in the High Court. Over the years, her four children grew up with their father, Isamuddin, a chokidar in a government school who died of cancer in December 2018. When Bulbul was around eight years old, he was released from the detention camp into the custody of Isamuddin. Khatun returned home on bail based on the same Supreme Court order that paved the way for Nessa's bail a year after her husband's death. Uh, then the chapter goes on on how I had met uh, Khatun's father while she was in jail and then uh, Khatun's father, Abul Qasim, basically describes to me how he goes. Uh, it's a, it was a long journey from Nogao to Kokrajhar, you know, the districts in Assam, uh, very, uh, it's, it's, it's at a distance from each other. Um, so these are the two women that you can read their stories in detail in the book. And this is, of course, most of you might be uh, one of uh, most famous citizenship cases in Assam. Uh, this is the ex-army man, uh, Muhammad Sanaullah, who was declared a foreigner and put into a detention center. Uh, and uh, this is a photo when he was taken to the detention center. Uh, on the left-hand side is my interview with him after he was released on bail. Uh, on the right-hand side is a photo from the day when, another day when I visited their house, I met his wife and she was showing me these photos of um, Sanaullah in, in the army uniform, you know, in all glory. Uh, I'll just read two paragraphs. Chapter 9, uh, No Lands People, A Soldier in a Detention Camp. On 29th May 2019, a day before Narendra Modi took oath as the Prime Minister of India for the second time, a retired subedar of the Corps of Electronics and Mechanical Engineers of the Indian Army was put into a detention center in Assam. He had been declared an illegal foreigner. Wadud, Wadud is uh, my friend, the lawyer. Wadud was also um, um, Sanaullah's lawyer, among other some other lawyers. He was also uh, uh, so he he led Sanaullah's defense basically and got him bail. Um, Wadud has successfully helped Mullah and many others like him to establish their Indian citizenship. However, many of Wadud's clients are still struggling at the FTs and courts. And Muhammad Sanaullah is probably the best known among them. 12 days after he was sent to the detention center, the Guwahati High Court granted Sanaullah interim bail. Renowned advocate of the Supreme Court, Indira Jaising, argued on Sanaullah's behalf, alongside Wadud, 
Rahman. Rahman is uh, uh, the other lawyer, uh, uh, Burhanur Rahman. Um, alongside Wadud, Rahman and senior advocate H.R.A. Chaudhary. Uh, Jai Singh, who was coincidentally traveling in the Northeast then, was so moved by the case that she decided to litigate pro bono on Sanaullah's behalf. Mohammad Sanaullah joined the Indian Army in May 1987 and retired in August 2017 after serving in insurgency affected areas of Jammu and Kashmir and the Northeast, among other locations. <coughs> Sorry. In 2014, he was awarded the President Certificate for his promotion to the rank of Junior Commissioned Officer. Uh, in 2002, Sanaullah's family had shifted from Kalahikash of Boko in Kamrup district to Guwahati. According to his ex-serviceman's ID card issued by the army, his monthly pension was Rs. 11,970. I met Sanaullah at his house in the Sadgaon locality of Guwahati a day after he walked out of the detention center. He was a man in his early 50s. He was dressed in a white shirt that day and he looked exhausted. What had unfolded over the fortnight left a deep impression on his face. He agreed to an interview and took a seat beside his wife on the sofa in the living room of their modest house. How did it feel to be a Jawan and to be thrown into prison with suspected illegal foreigners? Sanaullah remained silent for a minute or two. His eyes were moist. When entering through the prison gate, uh, began Sanaullah, I cried and cried. I asked myself, what sin have I committed that after serving my motherland for three decades, including at the LOC at Kupwara in Kashmir, I am being declared as a foreigner. I have defended my country standing bravely at the border. I love my country. I am an Indian and I am sure justice will be done in my case. So Sanaullah's case is still, uh, Wadud and others are fighting Sanaullah's case. It's in the Guwahati High Court. And um, he is still, his, uh, you know, his citizenship is still under question. And uh, that's how it, the situation stands as of now. And uh, we've come to the last part of the slide. It's, uh, it's the CAA and the NRC. Um, um, combination, and I thought that it would be good to include this because there is a uh, there is a great resonance about CAA per se across the country. Uh, so we have to understand that uh, that in the northeast, especially in Assam and other states, uh, the the context of the CAA is slightly different. Say, for example, um, a large num um, a large part of the protests across the country were on the basis that on a on a theoretical kind of a analysis that if the if there is a pan india nrc if and if there is a caa then will the muslims uh, without their papers be excluded the question was that whether this is the hindu majoritarian bjp led governments um, plan and action to, uh, to, to exclude Muslims. Then of course, um, the CAA has not been implemented on the ground as of now. The government has stalled, um, you know, um, as uh, Narendra Modi had uh, famously said from the Red Fort that um, there is no plans for a pan-India NRC. Uh, uh, so of course, those discussions have slightly taken a backseat, but the protests in Assam, this is a photo I had taken on the evening um, when uh, the CAA was passed in the parliament, massive protests had broken out in Assam um, and other parts of the Northeast. This is Guwahati, center of Guwahati. Um, there is, uh, uh, in fact, uh, I think a couple of minutes after uh, I had taken this photograph. There was a firing uh, at this location. Uh, a protester had probably succumbed. Um, and um, the context in Assam regarding the CAA is slightly different, you know. So the 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 socio political leadership of Assam, the socio cultural leadership bodies like the ASU, which are very influential. Uh, there is a long interview with with one of um, ASU's, uh, you know, the most important leaders 
on um, on what the CAA, uh, you know, what does it mean in the in the context of uh, context of Assam? Um, I'll I'll just try to you know read it so that it's it's um, it's more. Uh, uh, The perspective on this issue of CAA in Assam and the Northeast, Asu advisor Samujal Bhattacharya told me in an interview, is different from that in rest of India. Demand is same, scrapping of the CAA, but the perspective is different. The overriding critique of the CAA in the Indian liberal discourse was that it discriminates against Muslims and violates the constitution by providing citizenship on the basis of religion. Uh, the real purpose of an all India NRC coupled with the CAB, wrote Arundhati Roy in an essay, is to threaten, destabilize and stigmatize the Indian Muslim community, particularly the poorest among them. Um, now, uh, moving on from, I'm, I'm not reading uh, Roy's uh, quote, which I cite here. Uh, but what I say here is, uh, is I stress on Samujal Bhattacharya's perspective of the ASU is that, uh, yes, the question of religion is there, Bhattacharya of the ASU said. Citizenship cannot be determined in India on the basis of religion. But here in Assam, the first concern is the threat to the identity, cult culture and language of the indigenous people. That's the core issue. It's a question of existence, he added, not a question of religion. We cannot live like second class citizens in our motherland. We cannot lose our culture, language and identity. The CAA violates our constitutional provision of light, right to live. So essentially, you know, uh, to explain it, uh, you know, if you read the book and if you read other analysis, you would get a much better idea of uh, of the of the, of the contrast between the pan India opposition to the CAA and the Assamese opposition to the CAA. So technically, the, uh, it's it's not that um, uh, it's not that the protests in Assam were for that you know say a theoretical questions like like why are Muslims not in the ambit of the CAA. No, the protests in Assam were that we will not take even non-Muslim refugees. I'm, I'm putting it in a very simplified manner, just for the audience to understand the, the, the contrast between here. And um, so, uh, I, uh, I mean, yeah, we can, uh, as I said, that uh, there can be mo much more detailed analysis about that, but uh, this is uh, this is the CAA NRC contrast here. So, uh, um, uh, so do we have uh, five more minutes, uh, or we should wrap up? If you could wrap it up in three minutes, it will be nice. Okay. So, um, uh, thank you so much. I mean, uh, I had put these two slightly chunky. Um, slides at the end because uh, these these would uh, uh, you know this is essentially the numbers game is basically the first chapter of the book and this is my most ambitious chapter in the book and i basically try to question this narrative that uh, you know whenever you read mainstream media reports or even some ac ac academic literature, most of the academic literature, most of the media reports on Assam, on Assam's issue with illegal migration, about illegal migrants from Bangladesh posing a threat to the culture identity of indigenous people of Assam. So whenever you read these Assam, these points are taken as normative things, as, as something which has already been established. So I try to go uh, beyond to see how such narratives, were there figures, were there numbers, were there, um, on what basis, on the basis of what survey are we talking? Have we reached this conclusion? So my research, which is, as I said, my ambitious first chapter of the book, is um, you know is uh, it all leads back to a 1931 report by a British colonial officer called C.S. Mullen, 
who was that year's census superintendent in Assam. And um, his census report was alarmist. He called that uh, Bengali uh, immigrants from what is now Bangladesh, peasants, farmers from there are coming into Assam. They are land hungry and compared this migration with a large body of ants migrating, you know. And so I'll, 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 I'll tell you how Mulan's report is interesting. So my point is that it's important to re read Mulan's report, but it's also important to read the modern critics um, because Mulan's report is always cited. So 70 years later, Mulan's report is brought to life by governor of Assam, Lieutenant General S.K. Sinha. In November 1998, he writes a report to the president of India, K.R. Narayanan, saying that, you know, quote unquote, unabated influx of illegal migrants from Bangladesh into Assam has changed the demography of the state and it threatens to reduce the Assamese people to a minority in their own state. So did he have a survey report, a census report to back his claim? No. He cited Mulan on depended on, quote unquote, broad estimates and broad explorations. Sinha cited former Assam Chief Minister Hiteshwar Saikia's 1992 figure of 30 lakh Bangladeshis in Assam, but didn't mention in his report, I mean, he, sorry, I, he, he did mention in the, in the, in, in the report, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not didn't, he did mention that Saikia himself retracted that figure just two days later. Now, I don't know why Saikia did that, but there, that, that that's a question for future future research. But Saikia did retract that figure. But people who quote Sinha's report never mention these points. Sinha also cited the former Union Minister Indrajit Gupta's figure of 10 million illegal migrants residing in India. Again, was there a survey? No. And following Gupta's comment, an India Today report said, based on intelligence inputs, that 40 lakh of these 10 million people were in Assam. So I filed an RTI, RTI application with the MHA asking that whether there was a basis of Mr. Gupta's statement. But the MHA sent me a response saying that, no, this first of all, this question is 20 years old. We don't have the data. But second of all, we would like to tell you that illegal immigrants enter into the country without valid documents in clandestine and surreptitious manner. Therefore, it's impossible to have a correct estimate. So Again, in the, in the context, we have to read Sinha's report, you know, the critics like Amnesty International calling it xenophobic and discriminatory against Bengalis. But people, who, again, people who cite Sinha's report never go into these criticisms. There is also a piece by my friend, the researcher Angshuman Chaudhary. Uh, it's a really pointed critique on, you, you, if you Google it, you'll find it. It's a pointed critique on Sinha's report. Um, and you... And there is this, two, and you also see that this language, this narrative, seep into the into the judicial world. You know, in say, uh, in the book, I go in detail into these judgments. You know, into studying these judgments. But the 2005 very well-known case, Sarmananda Sonwal, who later on became a Sam CM uh, versus Union of India, uh, in which the Supreme Court famously said that yes. Uh, Illegal migration from Bangladesh is external aggression. That, that, that's, that changed the narrative in the country. Uh, you know, it had very wide ramifications. And this judgment cited Sinha's observations without going into the, the, the contrary arguments, the debates which we can have on Sinha's observations. Then the 2014 um, uh, Supreme Court verdict, which led to the NRC, through which the court pushed the NRC, you know, it began by quoting Mulan, then Sinha, and then cited former minister Sri Prakash Jaiswal's 2004 figure to the parliament that 50 lakh immigrant, illegal migrants from Bangladesh in Assam, you know. But if you what I did is I went back to that parliament uh, response documents and I found that um, that response was retracted by the MHA. And, the, and now if, uh, in, the, in the reference uh, sheet in the book, you'd find that link where to find it. Um, the MHA says that th that data which Jaiswal said in the parliament actually had a clarificatory note which the minister did not say. And the clarificatory note said that this number was not based on comprehensive or sample study, but on hearsay and that too from interested parties, you know? 
and again just the last point i mean that the, that the court and uh, and the media and uh, um, you know they were not the only one but uh, you know even the asu had in during the assam movement they had said that 50 lakh foreigners now from where these numbers come from how, and the way they shape narratives the way they build narratives it's amazing i i mean like uh, i would i would request uh, i mean a lot of hard work had gone into this first chapter which is numbers game if you can please do read the first chapter at least thank you thank you so much thank you abhishek um i think we have exceeded our time limit so we will be taking two questions um are there any questions come in on the Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi, this is Francis from Chennai. Uh, I just have one question. How normal the situation is in Assam? How the citizens are taking the situation? Uh, is it normal or the conflict uh, is getting uh, higher and higher? Um, before answering, you could exit your sharing of the screen and you can come in. Uh, thanks yeah no i mean the uh, to uh, to um uh, as a server saying that uh, time limit we have exceeded the time limit to to answer your other question as in a in a brief manner you know um, um of course a more sociological or a, a in depth journalistic study would g- give a very uh, good answer to your question but the way i see it is that uh even in the last um, state elections you know last year uh the narrative this this the, the political narrative of the otherization of especially bengali origin muslims because you know there has been the otherization of bengali hindus in assam like as i said my grandmother is not in the R- uh, nrc but but at least the the, hin- the 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 government in par is ideologically there is a there is a theoretical and ideological support towards bengali hindus uh, you know mm-hmm. but the same government has gone full full at full force in this narrative of otherization of the bengali origin muslims in assam you know and in fact uh, uh, the the last state elections last year uh, it that narrative was the most dominant political rhetoric this 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 difference that it is a clash of civilizations we have to save a civilization uh, we have to protect uh, the indigenous against these others so yeah i i i guess uh, and and as you say that how is the so, uh, i don't know if you follow news uh, from assam late last year there was this eviction drive and which in which a, a bengali muslim person was first you know shot uh, shot by the state police during the eviction drive and then you have this photographer a photographer who is apparently a media photographer employed by the district authorities there was this viral video of that photographer jumping on the corpse of that of that poor villager you know so um yeah i guess i can answer your questions only through case studies and examples i mean rather than drawing a very conclusive uh, conclusive um, uh, line yeah exactly. thank you that's my thank you one more question uh, it's on you can ask uh hello my name is anika thank you for the question my question is on uh, you know you said that it's uh, reached the stale bit and uh, there's also reports of the cost of the exercise the fact that in actual numbers they haven't been able to do much in terms of deportation but was that the end game or the fact that you know they they, they they factored in the stalemate they factored in this mess but in spite of everything there are significant electoral gains for the party in power so uh, so you know the, the what we talk about is a bureaucratic mess or the stalemate is something that they have factored in and they don't mind it they don't mind that the muddle stays on as long as it creates this environment that they're able to have electoral gains Yeah, yeah yeah i mean thank you so much for the question i mean that that's that's one of the things which is 
most important to understand, you know, because uh, once the stalemate happened in 2019, when the NRC was published, the, the BJP went full uh, at full force that we will not accept this NRC come what may, because our understanding of foreigners in Assam is very different. And this NRC doesn't serve our purpose. This doesn't work. We are not. So they have. So what they did is they petitioned the Supreme Court that they do not accept the NRC published in August 2019, and they want a re-verification. Now, what they mean by re-verification is, again, another chapter of analysis, you know. But the, but the question is that in last year, in the election manifesto, state election manifesto, it was a point that if we come to power, we will re-verify and correct your NRC because this NRC needs correction. Which, of course, which, when the BJP is saying that you, you understand the political... Uh, connotations of that statement. So, of course, they, they benefit from the stalemate. This, this promise of solving, it has, it has been going on for decades in the state. Poor people have suffered. Uh, people's, uh, as you can see in the case studies, I mean, lives have been lost. Uh, and uh, certain politics keeps on benefiting from this. See, this is going to be a slightly different question. There is an idea that you should understand the periphery to understand what will happen in the center later. And generally, uh, the experiment starts at the periphery. What was your learning as a journalist who covered Kashmir to come and do this work later in Assam? Uh, thank you so much. I mean, um, th this is one of my favorite... Um, uh, favorite um, questions which I have struggled with uh, myself is that the first thing which struck me is that, I, I, as you said, I reported Kashmir for three years. I, I was based out of Srinagar. I was uh, the Hindustan Times Kashmir correspondent. Um, what I reported on a daily basis was this massive disenchantment with the idea of India. Young boys uh, picking up stones and throwing it at, at, at forces which represented the Indian state, uh, the Indian army, the CRPF. And uh, educated young men picking up arms, escaping from their homes and going to join the militant ranks to fight against the Indian state. And um, on the other hand, when I came here, I realized that people who had nothing, people who had nothing, were willing to give up whatever minimum they had, willing to give up the small plot of land that they have. If you read why Ajbahar Ali's wife died by suicide, because she could not bear the pain that her son was doing everything possible to manage some money to fix a lawyer to appeal to the Guwahati High Court that FT order is wrong, Ajbahar Ali is an Indian. So this contrast that I saw at the two peripheries, um, I mean, it left me completely bewildered that, 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 to, uh, that, that to understand, as you said, I mean, to understand how this country functions, it's, it's really, the peripheries have a lot of curious, a lot of, which would hold a lot of journalistic curiosity, the phenomenons that, that are happening at the, at the peripheries. Is there any question? With one more question, we can wrap it up. I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, government is spending a lot of resources, like human resources and funds in creating all this. So, uh, but uh, what is, is it really worth in uh, doing this uh, exercise, complete exercise? In yeah, th thank you. And yes, I mean, uh, there, there is, uh, there is uh, in the book, the estimates of the financial, uh, the cost to the state, exchequer, those uh, uh, monetary uh, calculations are there. But to answer your question, you know, I would only say a very simple uh, point that um, so many years, so many such push by the Supreme Court, such political push, judicial push, bureaucratic push, you know, when the exercise was going on in Assam, uh, <laughs> government officials have told me off the record that they are facing 
problems with managing their staff because the NRC operation recruits their staff from other, like teachers were taken, you know. But at the end of the day, you realize that the day the day NRC 2019 was published, people would not accept it. I mean, the ASU said that, no, how can there be only 19 lakh Bangladeshis? Eminent personalities have told us not less than 40 to 50. We ourselves believe it's 40 to 50. The BJP said that, no, it's wrong. It's that the wrongful inclusions and exclusions will appeal for re-verification. We are not happy with this NRC. We cannot accept this, you know. So you realize that at when the question is that that that, that does does an exercise which claim to be so technical, so rational, so technology based, you know, document based. And that arrived at a figure of 19 lakhs, and that is also contested figure because everyone of this 19 lakh, some hundred, whatever, random cross section that I met, they are ready, as I said, they're ready to fight tooth and nail to prove their Indian citizenship. So even this 19 lakh figure is contested, number one. And number two, with this 19 lakh figure, figure, you realize that the important social and political organizations, they're not happy. No one is happy. It's, It's a stalemate. I had reported a story in August 2020, one year since NRC, there are Muslim families whose visa, whose passport verification for a Hajj pilgrimage has not been accepted, cleared by the local police because their names are not in the NRC. So there are people who are struggling to struggling with, you know, simple activities, uh, bureaucratic and administrative, because their names have not been in the NRC. They want to, they want the appeals process to start and clear their names. You know, they are saying that, no, we have the documents, we'll clear once given an opportunity. For some reason, we could not uh, in the earlier instance. So no one is happy. The issue continues. And as someone earlier pointed out that the that the political narrative only gains from this. It continues gaining. So I don't know. I don't know what's uh, what's the end game, and I I don't know. A deportation is bleak. Possibility of deportation, as I said. So yeah, it's it's all murky. That that's all I can say at this point. Thank you, Abhishek. It was a very important presentation. It gave people who are outside. Uh, the seven northeastern states, the complexities of these issues. Thank you for raising the question of who is an Indian, war, and what does it mean to be a citizen? And thank you for finding time. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry I exceeded the time limit. If, uh, to... No, absolutely no problem. It was a good presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Bye.